I'm your host, Christina Consolo, and this may just be the most important show that I've ever done. Please feel free to remix and share this video everywhere on social media so that the U.S. crew members who are not aware of the situation will be informed. You're going to be hearing firsthand today what it was like to be in the aftermath of the Tohoku earthquake, the Fukushima reactor explosion, and the enormous devastation from the tsunami and the extraordinary relief efforts that were provided by U.S. servicemen and women that were part of Operation Tomodachi. However, the devastation and death that surrounded these servicemen and women would have unforeseen lasting effects from the radioactive contamination that they unknowingly were exposed to. For those of us who have followed this nuclear disaster from day one, many of us have wondered whatever happened to the crew members of the USS Ronald Reagan, which was widely reported by mainstream media to have been contaminated and moved offshore. Videos were shared where the US Navy sailors were swabbing the decks without protection, and there was behind the scenes video of sailors being measured by alarming Geiger counters. However, this was only a very small example of the number of servicemen and women that were exposed to weapons-grade plutonium and a host of other radioactive contaminants, not just for a few hours, but for 80 days during the extent of the relief operation. And it wasn't just crewmen of one ship. In addition to the U.S. Ronald Reagan with its crew of 5,500, the group also included four destroyers, the Preble, McCampbell, Curtis Wilbur, and McCain, the USS Chancellorville, the USS Essex, the USS Harper's Ferry, and Germantown, as well as several other support ships. The rescue operation was requested by the Japanese government and coordinated through the NRC, DOD, and DOE. It consisted not only of the ships and land-based truck drivers, helicopter crews, and carrier-based aircraft and helicopters, but personnel also from the Marines and Air Force. So far, 150 servicemen and women have developed a wide variety of illnesses, which may be from their exposure to radiation that they received during their mission. One of our guests today, Mike Seaburn, was the senior chief mechanic for the helicopter squadron based at Atsugi, and he's here to share his story. Also with us today is environmental law expert Paul Garner, who filed the lawsuit against TEPCO in San Diego Federal Court, and Carla, one of their sponsors. Welcome to the show, everyone. Nice to be with you this morning. Thank you. How close were you to the epicenter of the 9.0 earthquake? We were about, I think, about 100 miles off of where the, uh, the center of the earthquake was. I had spent about 15 years in Japan, so I was pretty used to uh, to earthquakes. It was nothing new, but it was it was bigger than anything I'd ever experienced before. When did you find out about the tsunami and the extent of the devastation? Did you guys hear the sirens from where you were? No, there was no sirens. We uh, we I was basically sitting at my desk at the hangar aircraft hangar, and uh, the entire world just started flip it around and turn it upside down and, and shaking erratically. Uh, you know, after all those years over there, you're pretty... One thing you know is once there's a big earthquake, there's going to be a tsunami, especially, uh, you know, in a place like Japan. So we kind of just braced for it. We didn't know exactly where it was going to hit, but we knew it was coming. How long after the earthquake and tsunami did you find out about the nuke plants that were having problems? Well, that wasn't initially told to us. The... Uh, the first thing, I think it went down on March 11th, and then on March 12th, we basically were pulled in by our commanding officer and told that we're on 24-hour standby notice and that we could leave at any time. And I believe that was, at first they said it was to do relief efforts, but then when, they, uh, when the Fukushima plant started acting up, that's when they kind of took a different turn and all of the fighter squadrons decided to evacuate down to Guam, and it was just us at HS-14 and our sister squadron at HS-51 that were going to go up to Misawa to take part in the relief efforts. 
Did you know anything about nuclear energy before this accident? Oh, my gosh, no. Uh, I knew absolutely nothing about it. So you were the, the chief mechanic for the, the helicopters at that base, but they decided to send you for some special training. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, once I had been selected for commission to become a, a limited duty officer, so they kind of realized that an instruction came out and that everybody in that city basically needed to pinpoint a radiation decontamination officer to head up a division that would be in charge of measuring and decontaminating the aircraft equipment and personnel for uh, beta and gamma radiation exposure. So they sent, when we came back to Atsugi, they sent me to a two-day school, and I was basically told by the NIMS that they were going to shove a two-year nuclear course into two days. So that was the uh, that was the training I received. So you learned about the Geiger counters at that time and, and measuring counts per minute? That's correct. We, we learned about uh, how to properly measure it, um, yeah, how to use, properly use our radiax, how to test them, um, how to decide whether it's fixed or, or loose contamination, how to protect ourselves, how to decontaminate, and how to store the uh, contaminated material. What were some of the guidelines they gave you for protection? Like when, at what point were you guys supposed to wear masks and so forth dealing with equipment? Well, that's a great question because with the naval aviation, uh, the nuclear radiation exposure has something that we had never dealt with in military aviation. Now, our ships, of course, most of them are nukes these days, but... As for the aircraft, we had never flown into a radioactive home before. So every single day, I mean, for the first month, every single day there was a brand new instruction that came out from Big Navy changing the parameters. And it was kind of learn as you go and learn on the fly. And, you know, the next day they would figure out a kind of a safer way to do things or a better way to do things, and they would come out with another instruction. But... Eventually, it kind of all came down, and it was agreed upon that anything over 100 ccpm, which is a corrected counts per minute, which is basically you take the, the, the counts per minute that it's reading, and then you subtract it from the air counts per minute, and that'll be your corrected counts per minute. So anything over 100, then you needed to wear gloves, double gloves. Anything over 500, you needed the Tyvek suit and double gloves. And anything over 5,000, you needed a respirator, goggles, Tyvek suit, and gloves. What was the closest point that any of the ships or any of the servicemen or women that might have been on some of these planes or helicopters were to the Fukushima plant? Well, they were flying in and out of Sendai, which is pretty close. I think, I don't want to give out a bad gouge, but I think it's no more than 20 miles away from Fukushima. And our guys were in and out of Sendai uh, ten times a day. And wasn't there a, a carrier that was, like, right very close to the plant? Maybe Paul knows that. Yes, I saw Facebook pictures taken from the U.S. as Bono Reagan, which uh, showed that it was very close to the shore. In fact, one of our clients... Uh, said that they were within two miles of the nuclear power plant, and they see they couldn't see the water. It was so full of debris. There's a whole house floating by, cars, uh, all kinds of debris surrounding the USS Ronald Reagan, and of course now we uh, know that it was all radioactive. Well, you saw the picture on ABC News. It aired over there. It didn't air in this country except on ABC News, and they showed that the... Uh, Reagan had sailed through a, uh, a nuclear plume, but um, they were basically uh, in and out. They, were, uh, they had uh, limited measuring devices on board the Reagan, but um, they uh, were, would sail in, sail out, but the, uh, the stream of material was so diffuse and airborne that it just carried uh, in, uh, it seemed to be carrying in the direction they were sailing in. And uh, 
I, I'll just uh, say to you that they got a very large dose. And the, pe the people who are in the know understand that most of the nuclear uh, radioactive material ended up in the water. It ended up in the sea, exactly where the Seventh Fleet was operating. Unbeknownst to them, uh, it was much worse than uh, they were told by the TEPCO people uh, through the Japanese government. And uh, basically, uh, they couldn't see it until it was too late. And then they realized uh, what they were dealing with, and rather than cut and run, they continued to uh, deliver humanitarian supplies to the affected people of Fukushima Prefecture and others who, uh, you know, were uh, without, uh, you know, the basic uh, necessities of life. In March, it was very cold over there. And in fact, uh, the, uh, many of our clients were on the flight deck of the USS Ronald Reagan where the helos would come back in and the jets would come back in and they had to try to decontaminate them as best they could with soap and water and radioactive water. They couldn't use the water aboard the ship because it was radioactive. They couldn't drink the water. Air uh, became contaminated. They had to batten down the hatches after that of what we saw at reactor below. Uh, and it took a while for Captain Burke to get all the equipment back on board, scrub it up, batten down the hatches, and get out of there. But as you said before, they were sailing around in this for quite some time. Were they that close when Reactor 3 exploded? We were all under the impression from what we saw in the news here that they were just in and out, but they were going on missions, some of the uh, fleet, like 30 times a day, was what I saw involving 17 tons of food, water, and blankets to people every day. Yes, well, you can imagine in Fukushima Prefecture alone, there were 2 million people, children, women, and it was devastating for them, the tsunami was the second punch. The first punch was the uh, earthquake, which was a 9.0, the fifth largest earthquake in recorded history. So that was followed uh, several minutes later, probably 30, 40 minutes later, by the tsunami. And then uh, that was followed by the uh, release of nuclear material. But the nuclear material had already released within the power plant after the earthquake. That's important. Workers saw cracks in the piping in the reactor. They saw venting steam coming in there. And nobody told the Seventh Fleet. They just said, hey, we've got it all under control. It's, I, I heard from one of the Fukushima 50 uh, last Thursday who was there trying to deal with the situation. And he said in the control room, they didn't know the control room was, was contaminated, yet they had one of these um, uh, devices, uh, you know, that would uh, they'd send in there, you know, with a camera and everything to scope things out. It was total devastation within there. You can, if you can only imagine what the, the people in the Seventh Fleet had no idea of, is that this 20-meter, 100-mile-per-hour uh, tsunami slammed into the power plant and pretty much ripped through the whole plant uh, and knocked out the only source of power, uh, external power to the power plant, uh, which would uh, feed the cooling system. Now, in their wisdom, they had several problems with this power plant in the past. It was an accident waiting to happen. It was built on a fault line. And we, our case is filed in, in, in San Diego Federal Court, and you can check it out on the court website. It's 12 CV, 12 Civil, 3032. And you can read the complaint and all the references in there, and it pretty well details the fact that uh, vital information was kept from these rescuers, these first responders who went in there to deliver humanitarian aid. And had they known, I think uh, Nick wouldn't be sitting here with you today describing what he went through. And you haven't even heard, you know, what he's got as the result or what his 10-year-old son suffered from. Maybe we should hear about that. Sure. Mike, do you want to share it with us? 
You know, I heard you kind of say on the intro that it didn't just last for a few days, it lasted for 80 days. But to be honest with you, we were still dealing with the radiation contamination of the aircraft and the equipment up until the end of this last year. So, yeah, so about three months ago, the aircraft were still radiated. Did you say till the end of this last year? Yeah, so about three months ago, the aircraft were still radiated. Where, were they still in Japan, or are they back on this side of the Pacific? Well, they were stationed in Japan. They're still there, but they're actually coming to San Diego next month. The squadron is transitioning and changing, platform, changing platforms from over in Atsuki and coming back over here to San Diego, and then another squadron is taking their place over in Japan. So that was the big push to get those aircraft cleaned of radiation before they were able to come back over to U.S. soil. Do you know anything about that process? How are they decontaminating them successfully? Yeah, I was actually in charge of the process. And, uh, you know, the big, the big issue we ran into, like I said, it was kind of a crap shoot, and everybody was kind of shooting from the hip on the safe and proper way to do these things. And uh, what we would notice was we, we the pretty lengthy instruction came out. Okay, when an aircraft comes back from a flight, take readings with your radiac on these seven different positions on the outside of the aircraft, on both sides. And if you find contamination over a certain point, go ahead and try to decontaminate it. If it's under a certain point, then don't worry about it for right now. And so we would kind of do that. And, you know, we would drop the levels down a little bit. And then about six months later, another instruction comes out, or we have to do kind of routine maintenance to change out internal parts with the engine. And, you know, our, our level of height security has fallen a little bit because we think these aircraft are a little bit cleaner now. So they're, they haven't been in the plane for about a year, and, and we're just trying to do some routine maintenance. The levels are low enough to where we can just use gloves. And then all of a sudden we pull out these internal parts and these things are rated at, you know, 10, 15,000 CCPM. And they, we think that they're clean. And, yeah, and these guys are running around with nothing but gloves on, you know, trying to pull these parts out. And then they find out that this thing is five times the limit of what you would be wearing with uh, respirators. 15,000 CPM, was that the highest number you've seen on any piece of equipment? No, 60,000 was the highest I saw. And at Sugi Base was kind of used as the storage facility for all of the contaminated equipment that the Army, the Marine Corps, and the Navy was using. So we had our wash plant down there. And after every flight, you had to go wash the aircraft. And to decontaminate, you had to wash the aircraft. And, you know, everything had to be washed. But this, this water can't just run into the ground because it's radiated. So they had to be stored in these separate bladders and, you know, ran through hazmat and the environmental guys. And uh, the Army, we were down there waiting for the opportunity to wash one of our aircraft, and the Army pulled out a... 60,000 CCPM radiator out of one of their helicopters. And it was it was absolutely crazy, crazy circumstance. Uh, the nuclear guys just kind of went nuts and, you know, deep sunk this thing into a barrel of water and other chemicals and then put a huge barrier around it, you know, police line, do not cross. And, you know, radiation actually feeds itself. And if you get radiation that high, it becomes its own source of power and energy. And it won't, it won't go away. You know, storing in a container is not going to do anything. So it will actually feed and it will grow. And so every day these readings around the area have to be taken. Okay, at this point, you know, five feet from that barrel, we're reading, you know, 750 CCPM. And, then, you know, and you just have to continue to monitor that now. From the hundreds of thousands of gallons of water that were collected, I have no idea what happened to it. But it's there somewhere, you know, along with all of the uh, contaminated Tyvek suits, gloves, equipment, stuff like that. But what we noticed when we went back to Atsugi, and the reason we, we left the to go back to Atsugi 
wasn't because it was safe. It's because we could no longer reach the areas of Sendai and Fukushima because the snow had gotten so bad. A blizzard had moved in, and we could no longer make it over the mountains because of the weather. So we actually went back to Atsugi and worked out of there. And we were told at any point we could, you know, because we were watching this nuclear plant. We had absolutely no idea what was going on. We're hearing from the Japanese government or the Japanese company that everything's fine, it's under control, but, you know, we're listening to Fox News and CNN and all these other places that are in the exact opposite, and the Navy is kind of trying to figure out which way to go with it. And we were told, you know, before you left, put your name and ID and everything, or your name and, and phone number in your dashboard, your car, because you're probably not going to get back. At Sugi was a basically a 50-50 shot of whether that base is going to be shut down indefinitely. And with the information we received, they had a, a not a mandatory evacuation, but they had a voluntary evacuation for all family members. But with the misinformation that was received from the Tinto company, a lot of people, including myself, decided not to move their family, especially with all the Japanese uh you know, there's a lot of guys married to Japanese women over there, and, of course, the Japanese don't want to move because, you know, their family's there, and that's their home. So many of them stayed, including mine, and, you know, had medical issues develop, and, you know, we're taking background readings. Explain to you what medical issues, like your son has had. Yeah, I wasn't aware that you had, you had a son that was living in Japan with you at the base. Yes, yes, I did. My son, uh, he went on a vomiting fit of about three months long. And it was the only thing wrong with him. But every day he would go to school and he would start throwing up uncontrollably and they would send him home. But after that he would be fine. And the next day he'd go to school and he would throw up and, and they would send him home. And he missed a month of school because of that. And I basically had to make a deal with the teachers saying, hey, you know, other than his uncontrollable vomiting, he's, he's fine. Can you please, you know, let him raise his hand and let him be excused to go to the bathroom so he can come back and not, you know, get held back in grade because he's missed too much school. Uh, he would vomit 15 to 20 times a day. And we, nobody could figure out what was wrong. The... Uh, Navy Medicine couldn't figure out what it was, and we actually took him out of town, but he had the uh, Japanese health care. And they did, I mean, CAT scans, they did MRIs, they were checking them for brain tumors and absolutely everything, and they came up empty-handed, and they could not figure out what it was. And he's still not as bad by any but nothing to the degree of, of what he felt from, you know, March till about August. Like, that's something I, I kind of wanted to get into with you also because so many of us have been experiencing symptoms on this side of the Pacific. And there's, there's a few things that are kind of hallmarks of, of radiation exposure symptom-wise. Something that was reported among um, military members who witnessed atomic bomb tests in the 60s was a metallic taste in their mouth, which is actually because you're tasting fission, which can also happen without radiation exposure, like if you have a um, certain types of medical tests, even using like a vegetable dye, but it's not something that people normally experience from anything in their environment. Do you recall ever noticing that or anybody that you knew? I have heard people say about, talk about that. Uh, I never experienced the metallic taste in my mouth, no. I did experience the uh, nausea headaches, you know, I would wake up in the morning with not a bloody nose, but almost like dry blood inside my nose. But those actually went away after a while. Uh, it was, I think, part of the immediate uh, acute exposure to where those symptoms came from. Now, honestly, it's, it's the long-term effects that kind of worry me, and it's, you know, five years down the road, ten years down the road. Uh, what's going to happen to me is kind of my main concern, you know. It was widely reported from residents in the Pacific Northwest in the weeks following the accident that people were complaining of this metallic taste in Spokane and Portland. Chris Starosa from Simon Fraser University reported that 10 million particles per liter of iodine-131 
were measured in rain in Vancouver and double that in San Francisco. So I mean, that's a, a long distance from the reactors. When? I will send you that article when we get off air today. When did they measure that, Christine? I believe it was in the first um, two to three weeks. Okay, good, because your listeners should know as we speak that the, uh, the radiation is still coming over because the TEPCO people who run the power plant uh, don't know what to do with the waste and they're burning it and concentrating it. And what they're burning is being released into the atmosphere and it's being carried through the jet stream. And what they're not burning, they're dumping into the ocean and it was reported that one of their contractors actually dumped it into a potable water source, a river, uh, not too far from there that people depend upon. So uh, tw they have 25 million tons of radioactive material and they've only uh, eliminated maybe 3% of it. So if it's, if it's the beat goes on and business as usual and people don't raise up and say enough, we're in for what Senator Wyden, Senator Wyden of, um, of Oregon went over there soon afterward on a fact-finding mission. And he came back and he was quoted as saying that what we have here is a disaster of biblical proportions. And he was going to write a letter to Secretary Chu, who is the Energy Secretary, and Secretary Clinton, who was Secretary of State at that time, who, um, you know, wanted to make sure that we responded to this and tell them, look, you've got to do whatever is possible to help the Japanese deal with this situation. And... By way of explanation, okay, the case I filed is Cooper against TEPCO. We're suing the Tokyo Electric Power Company that was responsible for operating the power plant, for maintaining a dangerous instrumentality, and permitting the release of this nuclear material, as you described, plutonium, cesium. They have cesium in the water supply in Tokyo right now. And the people there are really in a rough spot. The Fukushima Prefecture was known for uh, its peaches throughout the world. Forget about that. They have their products removed from uh, advertisements, from catalogs. They can't sell anything. The, the fishermen from Fukushima Prefecture do not offload their boats there. They take them to other prefectures. The prefecture is like a state. So can you imagine you go from the Gulf where you got poison in the water, and you offload it somewhere distant from there, and you say, hey, the fish is fine. Guess what? They're not. They're not. It's gotten into the food chain. It's gotten into our air supply. And uh, Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont urged the Department of Defense to establish a registry and the uh, doctor in charge of the uh, Veterans Administration welfare within days of March 11, 2011, urged that a registry be, a registry be created to track the 70,000 military personnel and support personnel and their families who were exposed here. And they started this. Christine, 70,000 and support people. 70,000, and they, they evacuated many of them uh, out of there, but uh, here's the thing. The DOD on their website had this Operation Tomodachi Registry, which they said was going to be completed by the end of last year. At a meeting on Thursday in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, I asked Dr. Stephen Rademacher, who's with the Air Force, who was thrown there by the DOD, Will that registry include all of the people in the Seventh Fleet who were on the vessels that you described? And he said yes. And the very next day, the very next day, I'm on my way back to California. I, I uh, learned that they decided to abandon the registry. After these experts came to this meeting and said, it's a lot easier to track people prospectively. You know where they were. You know what doses they may have been exposed to. You can get their medical records and you can follow them 
5, 10, 15, 20 years into the future and make sure that they're getting proper care. And the Defense Department has abandoned that. They let these people, these people are left with no recourse except through this non-governmental lawsuit that we filed, which we're going to include all 70,000 in and toll the statute of limitations by March 11th of this year. It's two years since this has happened. And if the government is broke and they can't afford to help uh, those who uh, they train and uh, send on a $4 billion vessel, the USS Reagan. And listen, I saw the Reagan last year. It's up in Bramington, Washington, in dry dock. It's been there for a year. They cannot get the radiation out of it. And it's come to my attention that some of the workers up there are uh, experiencing symptoms just by reason of the fact that they have to work on the ship that's there. So it's not going to go away. And uh, I would share with your listeners the fact that it's come to my attention. They can check this out on Bloomberg News, January 24th of this year. Former TEPCO chairman said question in Fukushima legal probe. Isha Katsumata, who served as chairman of the power company known as TEMPCO, until June of 2012, was interviewed by investigators probing alleged professional negligence resulting in deaths and injuries connected to the accident. Kyoto reported today. That's at a news agency. So by June, they expect to release the results of their investigation. I suggest don't hold your breath because the government of Japan campaigned, the present government of Japan campaigned on the promise to restart all 50 nuclear reactors throughout Japan. There are only two in operation today. They want to start this Fukushima reactor plant, although three of the reactors have melted down, and they use seawater in order to cool them and cool the fuel rods and let the seawater run back into the ocean. But guess what? You don't have to be a rocket scientist or an engineer to know that if you pour salt water on metal, it's going to corrode. This, this reactor is over 25 years old. It's reached its life expectancy, as have all of the others, the GE reactors and Toshiba maintained reactors throughout Japan. They don't want to take them out of service because they want to keep using them to, to boil water, to generate steam to make power, and they're going to put them back online, and we're all in trouble. And not only that, they have a deal in the works where they want to buy new reactors to put in there. They don't have enough. They don't have enough of them. So understand this. Japan, there isn't a place that isn't on a fault line there. And they're right now, the TEPCO people are buying coal. They're buying oil in order to generate power. It's too expensive for them. It's all about money, money, money. Instead of encasing the spent fuel rods that they stored on the upper deck at uh, the power plant, they had to call in fire engines to hose them down to keep them from basically melting down and releasing more plutonium, even though the fuel rods are quote-unquote spent, just like Mike described. The radiation keeps coming, keeps coming. All they can do is encase them in cement. It costs a million dollars per rod, and they don't want to spend the money. And like uh, former mayor Ed Koch of New York said, piggy, piggy, piggy. Uh, I don't know that uh, there's going to be much change unless it occurs from the bottom up because from the top down, oh, we have a situation where our government, just as the government of Japan, is captured by an industry that's a multi-billion dollar industry. And we're not fighting to shut down all nuclear power plants. That's not our goal. But for God's sakes, you know, if you're going to operate something, do it in a reasonably safe manner. If you have problems, realize you have problems, 
and address those problems. You know what I asked the, uh, the representative of TEPCO, who they sent to this conference over in, in Scottsdale? He was one of the Fukushima 50 who was sent in there. He, you know, they sent him in. It was like a story that you hear from a victim showing slides of the devastation and everything and saying, I don't know if I was going to live because the radiation levels were so high in there. So they send in another rescuer, so to speak, and they don't expose their higher-ups who run the show who they were supposed to produce from their office on L Street Northwest in Washington, D.C., where they maintain a site where they lobby the hill and they have an office in London, a big international company. And it's run by people who really don't care except about the bottom line. Now, since June, since June, Christine, since June of last year, the government of Japan has become its major shareholder. They pumped in billions of dollars again into the company. And they said that the government would stand by their losses, stand behind them. That's all we're asking them to do here for these people who are affected. Now I have over 150 people who were young, who had no problems before, who were, like in their early 20s, who were cleared to operate billion-dollar equipment and be our first responders and protect us from the bad guys. They got leukemias. They had growths. They're undergoing uh, uh, surgery to remove uh, lesions in their brain. A couple of them have had them and have, have lost the sight in their eye. One guy has testicular cancer. He was aboard the Reagan. He's 21. He had a, one of his testicles removed already. And you know what their uh, you know what their talking points are? The Tepco people and uh, and those in power. It's all low level radiation. Nothing to worry about. It's too little to worry about. You don't teach us. I said, if they get away with this, then, uh, you know, what the heck uh, did we fight Watergate for? What the heck did we, you know, what happened to our Navy? What happened to our Navy? You know, it's like we had a Navy under JFK, PT-109. He swam to protect his crew, take care of his crew. I'm not sure that, um, you know, we're going in the right direction. What I do know is this, and speaking to everybody that I've spoken to who was there on the scene, this was a disaster. They weren't trained to deal with it. They're like the firemen rushing in, responding to a disaster. They were to help the people. And if we're going to turn our backs on them, I just say, like we say in New York sometimes, forget about it. You know, there's no hope for us if we can't take care of the people who take care of us. And Come on. Everybody watches the Super Bowl. You can donate $10 to the help our troops. You can help our troops. I want these Tepco people to help our troops. I, I have pleaded with them. I have asked their lawyer, please help us. We have people who are dying. We have people who need medical care, and the VA is not equipped to deal with them. One woman who was over there, stationed over there and left, She's already had a bone marrow transplant at the NIH in Maryland. Thank God she got it there. You know, that's the best of the best. I got a couple of clients who are in Florida. Jamie Lee Quinn is bleeding incessantly. She never had a problem before. She's a young woman. And her, her fiance, uh, he's a weak as can be. And he, they're worried. They, they're worried. They don't know what's going to happen to them. And nobody who they work for is tracking them. And you can bet that Tepco people have their hands full over there. So just in conclusion, um, Mike already touched upon this, you know, the, uh, uh, the long-term effects are really uh, the unknown question here. But the short-term effects are clear. And I have to really bite my tongue when, when uh, the uh, see no evil, uh, hear no evil, speak no evil people say that it was all low-level radiation and it's just an aberration that now you have 150 people growing, growing every day 
we got issues. One final point. We heard from a, a professor who went over there on a 10-day fact-finding mission. And he reported that within the first 30 days, over 500 medical uh, doctors and support people left Japan. So they have a real vacuum in terms of getting treatment. There were doctors who actually refused to treat anyone who came out of Fukushima province. And there's been a, uh, Mike touched upon, you know, they put the radioactive radiator in water, in soap and water. Okay, what they're doing over there now in Fukushima is not much. But in the adjacent province where they get their consumers from, they're power washing the bark of the trees to try to get the radiation out. But they don't know how to get the radiation out of the forests. And the persimmons are not sweet. They're, they're sour. They're also scraping up the, what they call low-level contaminated soil. And they're putting it in blue bags. And they're piling it up in parks, in schoolyards, you know, at, at public buildings. And the government has asked, other prefectures, when you take this low-level contaminated soil and bury it, they say it's harmless. Guess what? Nobody wants it. Not, no one wants it. And and so they got a real dilemma. And and the poor kids from Fukushima, they're not now known as the Fukushima fatties. Because they're all getting diabetes, and they had 54% of children age 11 to 15 have thyroid nodules and cysts. There you go. There you go. So, And they want to attribute it to the fact that it was wintertime, and they were staying in and playing their video games and watching TV, and thank God they were indoors. It wasn't like Chernobyl. Hey, guess what? Chernobyl happened over land, and what we learned from Chernobyl we're seeing reappear in these victims of Fukushima today. So tell me another story if you say, oh, this is not as bad as Chernobyl. This is nowhere as bad. It's all low level. And we don't have to worry. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's uh, mind-boggling to me that, uh, that people can take this uh, ostrich technique when people around them are dropping like five. You know, and they... Just, uh, you know, go on with business as usual. They set up a fund over, uh, Tepco says they set up a fund to try to, you know, to help their people over there. I've received correspondence and spoken with people who are over there, and they're crying out for help. They're saying, Paul Garner, won't you come here and see them over here for us? We're really hurting. First of all, you should understand this. Japan's culture. They're very uh, attuned to radiation since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They're probably more uh, more concerned about it than any other country around. Okay, but um, they uh, they had a triple landing here, as I described before, and in their planning, they planned for each of the three eventualities: the earthquake, the tsunami, and the release of radiation, but not all three at once. And that makes a difference. So the regionally now, in the New York Times, it was reported last Friday that the nuclear industry in Japan is trying to enact more safeguards. One of the safeguards they're recommending is that they have more than one power source for the nuclear power plant so that, for example, here when the tsunami knocked out the tower that had the power source, uh, they would have a backup power source. Well. See, I asked the representative of Tepco, I couldn't resist, even though he was low level, because the title of our get-together was Lessons We Have Learned Since Fukushima, almost two years down the road. So I asked him, perhaps, did you learn that you should not place the backup generators next to the seawall such that they would be inundated by the tsunami and rendered useless, and you would only have one generator left? Come on. Anybody knows that you lose the power and if you don't have a generator, you don't have any source of powering equipment, pumps, cooling systems, everything. So he says, after the interpreter and a pregnant pause, he says, yes, it would have been better to locate 
the back of Henry's on the hillside, because it's built on the side of a mountain, okay, and it goes down to the sea. And so he says, then we would have to have an independent water source in order to cool the reactors if, if the power shut down. Well, they have those at other reactors. You know, they have them. And, and uh, you know, it's, there's, there's a, uh, a uh, gentleman in Japan who's been attending all these hearings that they have on what changes they should make. And he says it's business as usual. It's, it's the same people who are in charge, the same people in the government who campaigned on restarting the power plant. They don't really care, it seems to us. And he says it's gotten down to the low levels within the government. So what, what we learned was just south of the power plant, they have J Village. And this is an assembly place where they fly in all the dignitaries. They had the Tepco, all the people who were making decisions in the nuclear industry there on how they should uh, deal with things. So can, can you imagine, you know, uh, the horse is out of the barn, and they're letting the person who let the horse out of the barn fix things. They brought in a, um, a new spin doctor named Barbara Judge. This was reported by Catriona Davies today on CNN. She is a 66-year-old lawyer and businesswoman with dual British and American citizenship and has been called in by TEPCO to help relaunch Japan's nuclear power program. She visited Fukushima on Saturday and said that she was full of hope and enthusiasm, not despair. She was amazed at how much work had been done to clear up the site and had high aspirations to make the site the safest in the world. You brought up an important point about Senator Wyden because it took him 14 months to go over there and see what was going on to begin with. And when he came back, you know, his letter made the press. Nothing has really been done since that time. That was in April, April of 2012, that he came back from that trip and sounded the alarm. All they've done is remove two rods from the spent fuel pool, and they started to assemble what I call the monkey bars over reactor four to help get the rest of the fuel out. We know that there were several fires in that pool, that the um, integrity of the cladding and the materials of those rods is going to be um, disrupted from those fires. They're not going to be able to just pull them out like the first two. And there's 1,565 fuel assemblies. So, I mean, that that's still <laughs> one of the most important aspects of what's going on over there is the Reactor 4 situation. The building is still leaning. The seismicity of the building has been rated at a zero, so even a small earthquake could make it fall. And where are the international experts? Shunned, pushed to the side, like they want to paint them as being crazies who are lunatic fringe, who are alarmists, like uh, global warming alarmists. You know, yeah, come on, it's not so bad, it's all low level. Chris Busby. Christopher Busby, he's over in England, he's been following nuclear problems and following this situation for a long time. At this conference, the people who are running it, it's clear to me, are captured by the nuclear industry. They wanted to besmirch him because he's trying to help the people in Japan. He came out with a substance called Busby-1, which has a lot of good things in it that might actually chelate some of the radiation out of the kids. And they got on him because they got to sell it over the internet and they're surfing and handling it's a long way to Japan. And but at least he's trying to do something. These guys who are like I spoke to this doctor back there, he went over there on a fact finding mission. He was Obama's emissary to go over there. He's a, a guy who responds to all these big disaster scenes and everything. So he went over there and he took pictures, he took photographs, he wrote a paper on it. Uh, about what he observed over there, he published pictures. One of the pictures we saw were people sitting in their cars. I mean, these two women were dead sitting in their car. It was taken from the back, thank God. But they were just two out of hundreds who were sitting in traffic jams trying to get away from the earthquake when the tsunami hit, and they just drowned in their cars. And they have other people walking around, civil service people walking around with push rods to poke into the silt to find bodies. 
fill up the bodies. We saw pictures like uh, two kilometers inland, just boats, no houses, everything gone, completely gone. So this is not going to go away. And this uh, expert, I would like to ask this expert if I had the opportunity, um, it's going to be the safest in the world. What are you going to do with the 25 million pounds? Try to wrap your head around this, okay? An elephant's 2,000 pounds, 25 million pounds. So we have 12, over 12 million elephants? Where are you going to put them? Where, where do they go? You know, where, where do they, none of the places in Japan want it. China doesn't want it. You know, the Japanese wanted to take over some provinces from China to outlying areas to deal with their population explosion in China. Said, no, no, you know, that's not going to happen. So here we are. We have, uh, incidentally, in the case that uh, we have filed, Cooper against TEPCO in uh, the Southern District. Uh, TEPCO has lawyered up. They hired a lawyer out of L.A., Greg Stone, and his, he's well-versed in, in handling uh, big, you know, uh, cases on behalf of polluters. He represented a tobacco company that poisoned the people's lungs in California. So he, they, got, they got people who are experts, and they have lots of money to spend, lots of money to spend. And it's like David against Goliath. And we started out with nine people, including Kim Dysakin, who was on the radio, and she was pregnant at the time and didn't know it. And her fetus, her baby, is now a couple of years old, doesn't speak. I'm not an expert, but, you know, they, the experts say the fetus takes up most of the radiation more than the mother does. But then I've got, you know, people who are bleeding from their behinds, who have uh, sores all over their bodies, uh, uh, one of one of my clients was in charge of keeping the log aboard the USS Reagan. Whenever the uh, device went off, he would record. He said, "Paul, it was going off constantly. We would sail in, we would sail out." I invite your readers to go on the internet and check out Energy News. Uh, there are some good articles on there and some interesting uh, references that try to point out the truth. And Christine, you asked about international scientists. They're contacting us. They're, they're contacting us. They want to help us. Former nuclear experts, whistleblowers from Three Mile Island, who, people who are familiar with Chernobyl, who've studied it for years, and they're not captured by the industry, and they're not going to make Boku dollars by coming out with some, uh, you know, whitewashing. Uh, you know, I'll send, uh, uh, you know, It'll be another Warren report. You know what I mean? We don't need that. We don't need that. We need the truth. We need it now. And my people, I started out with this small group only. I wasn't seeking to represent hundreds. We weren't. We, that wasn't our mission. We wanted to investigate and find out from witnesses who were there and who knew what was happening. And the floodgates have opened. They're all climbing on board. There's no help offered to them. Uh, much as I'd like to, the VA is not equipped to deal with these issues. And um, the, the familiar story I hear over and over again from those who are out or those who are in who got treated at the VA, if they or their wives happen to mention to the doctor, I was at uh, Operation Tomodachi, Operation Friends in off Fukushima, and I haven't felt these symptoms before, and now I got them. Do you think it's related? I'm not sure. I don't know. We'll get back to you on that. How can people um, contact you if they're just learning about this case and maybe they were serving uh, in, the, in the military in that, in that capacity and maybe experiencing symptoms now? We're trying to set up a website so that people can go to that, and it's in progress, but it's taking a little time. But in the meantime, they can email me, PCG, my initials, PCG, at dharmalaw.com, 
or uh, and or my associate Daryl J. Brooks. That's D A R Y L, the initial J B R O O K S at roadrunner.com, or uh, they can uh, call me at seven six zero six zero 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 eight one. And we'll get them involved in the study. What we are doing is we're gathering the medical records that the DOD said they were going to do. And we're performing blood testing on as the people who haven't had blood tests in a long time so we can have a differential and find out, you know, perhaps what's going on. You know, it's not normal to have a white blood count of 40,000. And it's not normal when you're a young guy to pass out at work and have to be taken to the hospital. We're getting to the end of the show. Best of luck to you, Paul, and to you, Mike. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for educating people. All we want to do is let them know what's going on. Nobody seems to be aware of this situation, and it's time that they became aware. Thank you. Thanks for being here, and we'll share this information far and wide. We'll put all your contact information underneath the video when it gets uploaded to YouTube. Best of luck, and feel free to come on anytime if you want to update us on the situation. Cheers. Share love, caring, and concern for your fellow man, and stay safe, everyone.